Do you have any reason to believe that anybody else would harm them? No, the only thing that I was told was that Cody would take care of it for me. This is Grant Armato trying to frame his brother for murder. In June of 2018, after dropping out of anesthesiology school, Grant was fired from his nursing job over allegations of improperly administering medication and stealing money. These charges were later dropped due to lack of evidence. However, Grant did not return to work afterwards. Instead, he relied financially on his older brother Cody, who paid all of Grant's expenses, including legal fees, and generously took him on a $10,000 trip to Japan. Despite his brother's support, Grant stole over $60,000 using Cody's credit card, spending every cent on a Bulgarian cam model. He also stole $200,000 from his parents, Chad and Margaret, completely depleting their life savings. On the 24th of January, 2019, after breaking yet another promise to stop contacting the cam girl, Grant shot his mother Margaret in the back of the head around 4.45 p.m as she sat working at her desk. He then lay in wait for his father to return home before shooting and killing him at approximately 5.30. Using his father's phone, Grant attempted to lure his older brother Cody home from work, waiting over four hours inside the house with his mother and father laying dead. Around 9.30, as Cody walked into the house, Grant killed him with a gunshot to the face. In order to frame the scene as a murder-suicide committed by Cody, Grant placed a different handgun near his brother's body. He then attached another holstered handgun to his lifeless father's right hip, the wrong side, given that Chad was right-handed. To tie this crime scene together, Grant connects both his father and brother's phones to his computer to concoct a text confrontation between them, creating a potential catalyst that would cause Cody to get into this imaginary gunfight with his dad. Grant then cleans the blood off his dead father's finger and uses it to unlock the banking app on his phone, transferring $600 to his own account. Several hours later, Grant sits in his car outside a local Publix, using the store's Wi-Fi to pay that very same $600 to reopen his account on the Cam Girl website. Two days later, he was tracked to a local motel and confronted by police. You're being cooperative, sir. We appreciate that. Um, some similar Kennedy detectives want to talk to you, so we're going to get nothing, their handcuffs off of you. Nothing in your pants, correct? Yes. Nothing. Yes, sir. You want to come here quick? We, you know, it's just a normal routine where we encounter someone that we want to make sure you're safe. Now we know you don't have any weapons, we'll, we'll get those restraints off of you. When police arrive to bring Grant in for questioning, he does not ask why, nor does he appear remotely agitated by their presence. The tone of the subsequent interview at Seminole County Sheriff's Office is initially very conversational, as detectives build rapport and make Grant comfortable. As the interview progresses, however, Grant gets almost too comfortable as he and the detectives test each other's resolve to see who can last the longest before the purpose of the interview is revealed. So you got a walk to coke right now? No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. I'll, I'll hold off on that. Okay. Hi, I'm Eva. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> hey, we really appreciate you coming up here with us. And, uh, at any time during this, you need to stop and go to the bathroom, want a drink, um, Snacks. saying just let me know and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be happy to get you. Um, my name is Danny Anderson, and uh, I'm a deputy from the county sheriff's office at the Eva. Mm -hmm. um, so we just want to talk to you a little bit and we'll get this in and out, be on our way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when this whole like wrongful accusation of the grand theft charge that I told you about in the car, when that happened, uh, I stopped working at the hospital, and then that took like. I don't think uh, we. No, we. I don't think we talked about that in the car. Oh, uh, well, I had. I was accused of grand theft for the third degree back in June of 2018. Um, that like went on for six months, and during that time, I obviously wasn't allowed to work because right. of it. So when that happened, obviously I was dismissed from that job, and then I couldn't get another job because now you have a, an outstanding felony charge on your name. Sure. Um, so then I got the attorney. It, it all went through, and then finally in December, uh -huh. they posted on the Orange County Clerk Courts or whatever website where your where your file is that there was no evidence ever ever presented. All the charges were dropped, uh -huh. and now I'm just in the process of expunging that from my records. Right. But 
Um, because you know I can't keep just not working forever. Sure. Uh, and you know that was that was kind of a a topic around the house was you know I need to get started here. It's notable that Grant still has not asked why he's been brought in for questioning, despite being on the ground in handcuffs just three hours earlier. Rather than asking one of the many questions that would come to mind in this situation, Grant conducts himself as if nothing is wrong. What do you like to do? What do I like to do? I like to watch anime. Um, me and my brother kind of started doing that back five years ago. I'd say he kind of got me into it. What is it? I'm sorry. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. I don't know what it is. I understand a few words. We actually just went to uh, me, my brother, and one of my friends or I guess friends from high school. We went to Japan mm -hmm. in from December first to December fifteenth. Oh wow! So we went because I mean, and it was anime that kind of inspired us to want to go. First time going. How expensive was that trip? Um, I mean, got plane tickets alone were like fourteen hundred bucks, and then I'd say it was probably about ten grand total for like all the stays mm -hmm. and one. For I mean, each one of you? Yeah. Wow. How did you pay? That's a lot of money for to be out of work. My brother. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My what, brother. What does he do? He's he's the CRNA. What is it? Sorry, the the certified registered nurse and Okay, so what you were what you what, I, what we were both in the program together. Okay. And then he was able to finish, and then I did not. So he was making good money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he making that hundred and fifty? Anderson sprinkles in seemingly casual questions about money. This style of questioning is known as funneling and is a useful technique for detectives when they don't want to give away their primary goal too early in an interrogation. For the observant viewer, this subtle form of questioning can also provide insight into where the detectives may go next in their pursuit of information. When the detectives ask how the trip was paid for, they know Grant has been out of work for six months following his termination. They are likely also aware that Cody and the parents had been supporting Grant financially throughout this whole period. He was working a lot. I mean, I don't know if he was, I think he was cusping a lot of overtime. Not scheduled, but like, it's just kind of what happened. Mm -hmm. He fails to acknowledge this was only necessary because of the costs Grant himself had incurred. Grant's most outrageous expenditure has yet to be even raised at this point of the interview. What other hobbies? Besides that, um, a number of years ago, like, me and my brother were actually, uh, like, gun enthusiasts. Anderson uses more funneling questions to coax out the subject of Grant's history with guns. Grant is still acting as though he doesn't know his family is dead, let alone how they died. So Anderson must be careful not to appear overly interested in Grant's answers. He engages in the conversation as though it's a casual chat between gun hobbyists, but in reality, he is downplaying how important this information is in order to keep Grant's defenses low. Close with your brother Cody? Let's talk about Cody. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Cody. Who's older, you or him? He is. I'm the youngest one. I'm 29, he's 31. Okay. My oldest brother, Jason, is 35 or 36 now. I mean, we he's were a better student. He was the better student in everything up through nursing school, and then I was actually the better student in nurse anesthesia school. But you were better at it. Yeah, uh, and that was the one time that he actually admitted that I was uh, didactically more competent than him in that field. You know, my brother had to, like, foot the bill for the to get the attorney. Um, so, you know, it's like I, there was a lot of stuff. What did you pay the attorney you know, off I think it was $8,000 for the... Holding, holding the attorney, retainer, like, retainer, retainer fee, and, did, and basically she had to do nothing. She had to do nothing, and um, he got like annoyed because he, like, he apparently wasn't told that it was non-refundable. But I, right. I, like, I know that I told him because, like, I had to send in the document signing it saying this is non-refundable. I've, I've known, of, known of any attorney that takes a retainer that ever gives you anything back. His lack of emotional engagement and the subtle resentment Grant expresses at Cody being annoyed belies how entitled Grant felt towards his family's help. This entitlement fully exposes Grant's perception of himself as the center of the world and gives the detectives insight into how he may have justified murdering his family. Despite how strange Grant's cool composure is under the circumstances, the detectives don't react to his lack of concern for his family's well-being. Yet.
Grant is still relaxed and chatty, giving hope in their plan to disarm him into confessing. Anderson begins to narrow his focus onto Grant's relationship with Cody. Any, um, ever any issues really with him? No, like I was saying, during this last six months, it, it had been a very trying time. Um, you know, financially, trying to get the job thing going, worrying about this whole what's going to happen with this legal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, even through it all, I mean, he would, like, have his moments where he would get extremely upset. Like, uh... Like, you know, he never gets violent, I guess you could say. But, like, at one point he got so upset that he, like, pushed a cabinet and then it, like, dented into the wall. Um, and he, I mean, so he'll, like, lose his temper, kind of like my dad. But, um, yeah, I mean, at least with me, he's always been, like, where he's, he's there for me. Like, wh whatever it takes, regardless of what's happening, I'm going to take care of it for you. The notion of Cody losing his temper is framed casually and with subtlety. Grant is still maintaining the facade he doesn't know his family is dead, so he can't go in too strongly with his intention to frame Cody just yet. Grant indicates that Cody would take care of it multiple times throughout the interview, sowing the seeds of his defense, throwing his brother under the bus. It's just, it would, you know, I, I couldn't help relieve his stress, I guess, as well as I always used to. My father chose to admit me to, like, a, like an, a depression or an addiction clinic or something like that in Fort Lauderdale called Cornerstone. Grant is significantly minimizing how and why he was admitted to the Cornerstone clinic. The reason for his evasiveness will soon become clear. When was that? That was December 22nd. Okay. Until, I think, uh, January 4th. Did you agree to go? I, I didn't, but they said that, you know, this was your only... Who said? My dad. Okay. And that was in Fort Lauderdale? Yes. Yeah. Did your mom agree to with it? My mom and my brother both agreed, but Maybe. it was Maybe. my dad who was like the iron fist, like, this is what's going to happen. Like, you know, he can't... Why did he say you needed to go? What was his reasoning? Because uh, with the way that I was acting he just he didn't see that I was doing anything for like the positive um, you know and a lot of it just came back to money uh, with him uh, he would he would like allow me to to spend money that he had uh, like with his credit card or something like that but it's like then whenever I did it was like a huge problem okay so you had one of his credit cards yeah and what were you buying with it uh, well, what I was doing is, um, over the past four months or something like that, I've been, ta I've been talking to this woman online. Who's she? Uh, she's, as embarrassing as it is, she's a, she's a yeah. cam, she's a cam model. A what? A cam model. Do you, right. do you guys know that? Nope. Uh, just, just like all the videos, you have to tell us. A cam model, it's like they, they... It's like a virtual girlfriend, I guess you could say. Okay. Like that type of situation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the money went to her. Okay. Where's she at? She lives in Bulgaria. Where? Bulgaria. Where's that? It's over in Europe. It's like okay. outside of Germany. Okay. Something like that. You ever been there? No. Okay. Um, so it, wasn't, it wasn't that serious. So okay. what would you give her money for? Um, just for like the time online with her. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was just like that type of thing. And what did she charge? By the minute? By the hour? Minute. Okay. Yeah. And how much is it per minute? Oh, God. I think it was like... It was like 90 tokens a minute, and it's like the conversion rate for all of that is... like $600 for like a like 5,000 or something tokens or something like that. So... And then it was four hours a night. Um, so, I mean, it's, I mean, that's basically just where all the, like, the costs went to was... You pay real money for the tokens, then you use the company's digital currency for, okay. for that. So you do that, and when did you meet her? I met her um, at the beginning of July. Yeah, at the very beginning of July. Okay, and and still talking to her? Still, yeah. I mean, more just on uh, like Twitter, okay. like just through direct messaging. Um, again, cell phone service doesn't work, so it's like I can't use the... The chatting like How that. much do you think you spent on this? Because it seems kind of pricey. Yeah. Nine, uh, 90 tokens and, and $5,000 for, for how many tokens? 
No, no, it's uh, six hundred dollars for for five thousand. For five thousand. Yeah. Okay. So how much do you think you spent? Um, on this? probably close to like two hundred thousand dollars. I'd say. Two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And where'd the money come from? Money came from me, uh, my brother, and then my dad. Did they know where the money was going to? They didn't know that it was going to uh, a cam, a cam model. I, I was saying that it was going towards my Twitch streaming, uh, like, Redeeming like, put, yeah, like advertising, like putting my name out there and that that type of thing. Nice. But based on what you're telling me, only so many people make so much money. So just, I think just a few just a make a bunch of money. Right. So well, that, that was like the, the ultimate goal is to get to that. I was hoping that, I, that the stars would align and then I would be like one of those people. Because I was good at the games and I, you know, I'm a, like a funny, pleasant person on the camera. Yummy. So I guess to like bring it all back with why I was brought to Cornerstone, mm -hmm. uh, it was a mix of all of those things. It's like, he felt like, you know, I, um, he felt like... You need to be grounded? Yeah, yeah. Grant's motive for killing his family finally begins to crystallize. The casual nature of his disclosure that he spent at least $200,000 of his family's money on a cam girl reveals far more than Grant intends. Not only does he show little remorse for his actions, but by minimizing the severity of behavior anyone would find extreme, he only succeeds in drawing attention to it. When Detective Maltari refers to Grant being grounded, she is drawing attention to the childlike dynamic between Grant and his parents. This maladaptive style of attachment is commonly a feature of arrested development, found in many people with narcissistic tendencies. These traits can manifest in different ways, but more common features include a grandiose sense of self, lack of empathy, immaturity, a sense of entitlement, exploiting others for personal gain, avoiding responsibility of one's own actions. These features underpin Grant's reliance on what is known as magical thinking to overcome problems. Here, it's expressed via his hope that the stars would align and his Twitch stream would recover the money he stole from his family. As discussion gradually closes in on the link between his imaginary relationship with Sylvie and the murders themselves, Grant's dependence on magical thinking will soon become even more evident. When was the last time that you and your dad did have, you know, a heated conversation? Uh, it would be Thursday? Thursday. Uh, because... One of his rules was that I wasn't allowed to talk to the woman anymore that I had been talking to. Um, but I guess you could say behind the scenes, my mom would let me talk to her through her cell phone using Twitter. Um, and, you know, she would tell me, like, look, you got to keep it, you have to keep it just basic because if you say anything or if you entice anything or do anything like that, it might lead her to say something to like my dad or something like that because How she in touch with him? because apparently when I was in Cornerstone my dad told her cuz cuz he had like hacked my computer or something like that and then he found everything the electronics guy like you and your brother except he's more of that like hacking level like able to do all that stuff so he had found you know um like just the stuff that was related to her mm -hmm. and then you know, he like he like erased my whole entire computer. He put a password on it, so it's like even when I came back up until Thursday, like I wasn't able to go onto my own computer to look at anything. I, he's treating you like a small child, right? And rightfully so. I mean, spending that amount of money, I was acting childish. I sure. I can kind of get it, but um. So yeah, anyways, on Thursday, he had apparently found out that I was speaking to her again, mm -hmm. and when I came back on the fourth. Me, my mom picked me up from the Cornerstone place, and then me and my mom met my dad at California Pizza Grill or Kitchen in Waterford Lakes. Mm -hmm. And he had this list front and back on a piece of paper of all the rules, this is what's going to happen, this is why I'm acting the way that I'm going to act, I'm not going to be dad anymore, I'm going to be Chad. And 
I basically told him that I'm going to be I'm going to be present. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to start trying to get jobs now. I told him what my plan was. Um, you know, it wasn't really my intention to continue talking to this woman, but it just kind of happened. Uh -huh. um, and then because there was, like, that emotional connection, I guess you could say, uh, between her and me, like, I, I like, you know, it felt like, like, like a relationship. You know, I didn't want to just stop cold turkey on it. Send me one of your videos. I just, I, I love it so much when you just send them to me. Yeah, I, I don't like buying your stuff. It makes me feel weird. Could you please send me one, though? So, he had apparently found out, and then... One of, happy. Right, and one of the stipulations was that he told me at the dinner was, if you speak to this woman again, you're out of the house. I'm kicking you out. You can pack up your shit, and then you're off my property. And then, because of the way that he used to be, he had told me that, basically, if that happens, that if I ever step back onto his property, that he would kill me. The day in question was the Thursday of the murders, in what was likely the financial trigger for his egregiously violent act. His father throwing him out of the house meant not only losing his housing, but more importantly, his means of contacting Sylvie. He characterizes his financial dealings with Sylvie as a relationship with an emotional connection. Bluntly put, there is no chance Sylvie viewed their relationship the same way. Grant's lack of self-awareness about their bond is keeping with the distorted worldview of a narcissistic personality. That Thursday that you meet with Cody down the street, is this past Thursday? Yeah. Okay. Tell me, tell me about that. After you and your dad argue. After me and my dad had argued and he had told me, you know, this is how it's going to be and, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Um, this is at the house this past Thursday. Yeah. Th yeah. Okay. Because this is what now? Saturday? Saturday. So yeah. Right, yeah. Past Thursday, I guess you could still say it. Um, so, then yeah, I spoke with Cody, he told me about all that, he had given me his debit so that, because I mean, I don't have any money, and I don't know where to go, you know, I'd never been out of the house on my own, um, and then the last thing that I was told was just that, you know, basically, once again, that he'll take care of it, because... This is Cody. This is Cody. What time, what time is this, approximately? I'd say a little after 10, 10.30ish, at night. Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so then after that, I just, like, stayed in that air in the vicinity area mm -hmm. for a number of hours, and then I had remembered over some of the nights when I would work overnight, and then I'd be able to, come, like, get off early, mm -hmm. that I could, that the Publix on 50, on Colonial, the one that's by the tractor supply? 419, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that public, it's like their guest Wi-Fi is always still active, even when the store closes down. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go there because I have my Surface, um, and I can, you know, check on my emails. I had to pull up the address to my interview because I don't have GPS. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would, like, write all that stuff down, and then um, I was basically just waiting in that parking lot until I had to leave to go to the interview. Yeah. The detectives are no longer hiding their focus on Thursday. Yet Grant has still not asked why he is being questioned. Grant's claim he used the public Wi-Fi for his job interview is shot down by evidence that later suggested he used it to pay yet another $600 for tokens with his brother's credit card. He refers to this purchase as paying an outstanding bill. It is clear Grant has put some thought into covering his tracks, but it seems those efforts were half-hearted at best. While being intelligent enough to surely be aware detectives would check financial records, this does not appear to have been of concern to him. It further appears he hasn't considered the detectives would find his lack of curiosity regarding the reason for this interview suspicious. These examples are quite extreme manifestations of Grant's reliance on magical thinking. Everything will be all right as long as he believes it will be. He further evinces his immaturity here, such as when he discloses not knowing what to do, as he had never stayed outside his family home on his own before, despite being nearly 30 years old. 
By asking for so much detail, the detectives give Grant many opportunities to provide conflicting information that may trip him up later. At this point, both Grant and the detectives are still pretending to know less than they do. The question now becomes, who will maintain the pretense longer? Like two weeks before I got kicked out, my dad was going through like a lot of episodes where he was losing his temper a lot, yelling a lot, especially when me and Cody weren't at the house. And, um... Who's he yelling at? My mom. So, was he being violent to your mom? Yeah, like, I think... Physically or just emotionally? Both. He had told her that if you... Or, he had told her that, basically, if I fuck up... Sorry for the language, but that if I, if I screw up, he's going to kill me, and then he's going to kill her. He said those specific Because words. he blames everything that happens negatively with me and with Jason, not with Cody, but with me and Jason on her, because were her so, favorites. So you have a reasonable belief in your mind that your dad could, could hurt you. Yes. He could hurt your mom. Yes. He could maybe hurt Jason. Yes. He's a violent guy. I'm sorry, I've been this a long time. He sounds like a violent guy. Yeah. Quick to lose his temper with him over minuscule stuff. Minuscule stuff, yeah. I get the point he's upset about the amount of money. I do right, get that. Right. But physically, he's abusive. Yes. And that night when you argued with your father and you said he grabbed your shirt and pulled you off the couch. Did he do anything else to you physically? No. No, he didn't, like, pursue it anymore. He was just... Did you tell Cody that he acted that no. way towards you? No, I didn't. Cody had no idea that there was a heated, physical, just the argument that you needed to get right. out because you were talking to this girl. Right. Okay. Why do you think we're having this conversation? I honestly don't know, but I'm pretty freaked out at this point because, you know, it's, uh... I mean, I know, like, how the situation was when I left, and, you know, I thought that it was weird to begin with that I hadn't gotten any communication whatsoever. I mean, like I, like I had told you, my brother, Cody, the last time um, when I was away from the house, that he was the one who outreached to me sure. via email because, again, I didn't have my phone or anything like that. So, I mean, I thought that it was weird, but I had just been kind of putting it out of my mind, thinking, okay, you had to go to work, or they're busy, when, or something. When you, when you were in your room, the hotel room, hotel hanging room. out, watching TV? No, I didn't turn on the TV. I had on just, like, music uh, on the, in the background, just kind of helped me go to sleep. Are you sure about that? Because the ho as, a, as a child, we're told the truth always is the best thing to do, correct? Correct. You agree with me? Yeah. And accidents happen, and things in the heat of the moment, things happen that we wish hadn't happened, but we make, I, I do it myself sometimes, my kids will make me so aggravated, I'll snap at them and then walk away and say, wow, I wish I would not have done that, that was not very adult of me to, to snap at my child or something. Yes, they're wrong, but I should be the adult and not snap at them. Right. Tell me what you think, because I, I can tell by, I've done this for a long, long time, and I read people the way they act and the way they, they talk to me and the way they answer questions. There's something you want to tell us. I can see it in your eyes, I can see it in your body language, and just your, the way you act. I'm just worried about what is all transpiring from this. I, I think at this point right now, to be honest with you, Grant, you know what it is. After demonstrating empathy with Grant regarding his father's violent behavior, the detectives subtly invite Grant to adopt a self-defense strategy. This is a long shot, however. As Grant knows if he follows their lead, he is left with no explanation for the deaths of his mother and brother. In the first distinct change of tack since the interview commenced, Anderson adopts a soft, paternalistic tone. By telling Grant a story about his own gentle style of parenting, he's positioning himself as the father Grant never had. Someone safe to whom he can unburden himself. The detective gambles upon the foundation he's laid thus far, and, in the first of many bluffing gestures, claims he can see in Grant's eyes and body language that he wants to tell the truth. Grant remains unmoved throughout this lengthy appeal. And we usually know answers before we ask it. Right. I, I knew, we, me and, and Eva knew everything before, before um, we asked you the questions. Now it's the time to, to come to Jesus, be honest, because you're holding something back. I can see it in your eyes. 
people don't believe that the police will help you, but we are actually here to help you with issues you may have. Um, I think something happened, and you don't want to tell us, but right now is the time to get it off your chest. And I really wish you would because it, it will make you feel better in the end. I, I genuinely don't have anything else that I can say about the night or, you know, the, the period of time afterwards. Detective Multari's interjection about knowing the answers before asking questions is an important facet of interrogation, whereby detectives build the illusion they already possess all the details, and therefore lying is hopeless. Grant is given little time to sit with this statement, however, as Anderson resumes his repetitive barrage, telling Grant that this is his come-to-Jesus moment. This approach, unsurprisingly, falls flat. Yet Anderson doubles down with a somewhat clumsy cookie jar analogy. There's only, there's only one opportunity to make that, that good impression. And to, if we've done something we shouldn't have done, you fess up it. You caught your hand in a cookie jar, you, you, you do it. Now, Was there anything else that happened at the house that you didn't tell us? that you've left out, but we haven't asked you, that would be of importance? Um, or during the time that you drove around for those few hours? Did you ever really go back to the house that you haven't told us about? Something that, something that happened that caused you to defend yourself. No, because again, it's like I didn't have, I didn't have any means to defend myself. I mean, I didn't. Well, we know from talking to that there's there's weapons in the house. Right. We know that to be to be to be a fact. Something happened that caused you to defend yourself. Whether you had anything or not, you found something to defend yourself with. I can't tell you everything. I'm not going to tell you everything. But something happened, whether your dad blew up on you, threatened you, physically harmed you, or hurt you. Something happened that caused an altercation. Uh, and I, I didn't do anything at the house besides get my stuff together and take it out to my car. Grant's facial expression is difficult to ascertain due to the camera angle, but his body language and verbal responses remain unchanged. While less obvious than other examples, the consistency of his response is a manifestation of Grant's magical thinking. He doesn't need to come up with a more elaborate response or worry about evidence or large holes in his story, as he believes simply repeating the same words over and over will be enough to disprove his involvement in his family's murders. At this stage, it appears Detective Anderson is the most fatigued person in the room. When he glances at Detective Maltari here, his body language suggests an attitude of consternation and disbelief at Grant's resistance to questioning. This is a suspect who is proving incredibly difficult to crack. This continues unabated, with no success for the next several minutes, until Detective Anderson tests another approach. You've been here with us. You think something bad has happened at your house, and to date, so long, you haven't asked us about anybody. Well, that's because for the like the last time that I was arrested, I mean, like nobody would tell me anything. I'm. Once you start telling me something that's truthful that I know, then we're going to have a conversation of exactly what happened. I mean, you're a smart guy. You know something's happened at your home. You have law enforcement here. You haven't heard or gotten any well, emails. Well, I mean, I, I'm just scared as to what the answer is. Well, you need to help yourself by filling in the blanks of what happened that night so we can give you the answer. Did anything more happen with you and your father besides him grabbing you up from the couch and yelling at you and kicking you out? Anything that at all? Did he, pull, did he harm you, hit you? No. Draw any weapons on you? No, he didn't do anything like that. I mean, he was just yelling. This, this is the time to come to Jesus, to be honest. Because you know more. I'm looking in your eyes. Your eyes tell me exactly that you, you are hurting inside. I get it. Brother, I get it. You're hurting. And this is the You're only scared. time we can help you. 
because once we get to a certain point, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's in the hands of who has it. Nothing I can do. Your family has no known enemies. Nobody has a problem with them. Nobody. Right. Continue what you were saying. You said when you But I mean, it's like and... I'm a. I just I don't I don't. Like I I just I don't know how to even say the words. Well, what would you? Give me a roundabout what you're thinking. That somebody in my family's dead. And how does that make you feel if you think if you're thinking that? I have absolutely no ability to to comprehend the words because, like I said, I've been there for my whole entire life, and even though there's been struggles and everything like that. There has never been any issues. There's never been the struggles or the issues like happened Thursday. Never for you. I, I believe you 100%. I believe it's never been like that. But something happened Thursday unlike anything you've ever experienced in 29 years of your life. Never. And maybe you felt that was rock bottom for you. You were getting kicked out of the house. Your father gave you an ultimatum. I mean, that's, you know, you're already dealing with the, the debt and you know now you have to stop talking to this girl and now you're being kicked out of the home I mean that's I I can understand how you would feel I mean that you'd want to lash out or you know if something happened you'd want to defend yourself sure absolutely but we need to know what happened I mean I know I can tell that you guys are like leading me into a certain way of what the only thing we're leading you to is wanting to get the truth from you. Not trying to make you say something that's not true, that's not accurate. The truth. The end. That's it. That's all we want is the absolute truth. Because it's got to come from you. It can't come from us. It can't come from us. Do we know what happened? Yeah, we, we, we already know what happened. But it has to still come from you, the truth. Because the parties involved... That's in, in all cases, you want the truth from them. I don't want somebody to say something that's not true. Absolutely not. I want them to say, this is what happened, and here's why it happened. Because some, sometimes there are things that are justifiable. I'm dealing with a case right now where some people were, were jumped in a house, there was a shooting, and the people involved in the shooting are not going to be charged because they have the right to defend themselves. Nothing in the, in, in, in the state or federal law says you have to be seriously physically harmed or, 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 or killed. Nothing does. You have a right to defend yourself. Absolutely you have a right to defend yourself. Fear of your... Sure. You being hard or your life. But, Grant, I just need you to come... It's, it's there. It's there. I can see... I genuinely don't have anything else that I can say about what transpired the, uh, during the nighttime. So when, when you left your house... Everybody was fine. Yeah. And when you left Cody... Everything was fine. Grant's feeble explanation of why he hasn't asked what has happened is unconvincing, to say the least. Yet, it effectively halts any momentum Detective Anderson was hoping to build with this loaded question. While Grant's speech has slowed somewhat, he is still very composed. His posture hasn't changed and he appears unmoved by Detective Anderson's lengthy monologue. As the lead detective implores Grant to tell him what they already know, he leaves little room for Grant to sit in silent discomfort. Instead, he relieves the pressure by occupying the space with speech after repetitive speech. Anderson's efforts again go unrewarded, and his response of sighing and crossing his arms reveals his fatigue and frustration. Did you do anything to Cody? No. Did you do anything to your mother? No. Did you do anything to your father? No. You have any reason to believe that anybody else would harm them? No, the only thing that I was told was that Cody would take care of it for me. And that's all that I know. But you didn't tell Cody what your father said to you, correct? Correct. So when Cody made those comments to you, what do you believe he meant by that? 
Have you guys ever talked about? That he was going to... I thought he was just going to do what he always does, which is where he just talks about it and he figures out whatever strategy he needs to. So if anything happened in the home to bring law enforcement there, what would you think happened? That there was a shooting. Between whom? I don't know. Between Cody and, and my dad. And why would you think that? to protect me or to help me or to do something with me. So you're telling me you did not shoot Cody, no. your father, or your mother? No. I mean, I don't know like what more I can say. Well, when law enforcement arrived, that's what they found. So you're the only outstanding child you're the one that's been having problems with your dad. You're the one that we haven't been able to find for two days. Do you understand now why would we would be questioning you about this? Yeah, but I mean, I wouldn't, like, I mean, I wouldn't be saying, like, all, like, you, I don't know the, the way to say, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know, like, what to even say. Despite all the build-up, the moment the detectives tell Grant what officers discovered in his family home is anticlimactic at best. Grant's reaction at this moment is very muted. He does not bother to enact a more dramatic display of feigned shock. It's likely he's still employing magical thinking to reassure himself all will be well as long as he keeps pleading ignorance of what happened to his family. It's difficult to call these deflections a strategy as they may simply be a function of his psychological makeup. For the time being, it's safe to say his stamina is proving to have more staying power than Detective Anderson's. I've seen so what is it you need over. to tell us that we're missing? Step over. I mean, the only thing that I know is just that, I mean, I, I uh, left the house later than what I had said. Um, Did you leave the house? with your brother Cody looking like that? Or did you leave the house with your father looking like that? Or your mother? Is that how you left your family? No. Nobody, nobody else went into that house. Who left your family like this? If you were the one that's been depressed, you were the one that owes money, you were the one that got into a confrontation with your father, who did this to your family? If you were trying to defend yourself or something else happened, we need to know now to help you. So tell us what happened, Grant. You've been arrested, correct? Yeah. So we have your fingerprints, correct? You understand that? Physical evidence is something I can't manipulate. It's either there or it's not there. Didn't fire a gun, didn't fire a gun, didn't fire a gun. None of them did. None of them did. Cody did not go or home. Or did your father home. point a gun at you? No, there's, there's nothing else that I can say. At this point, the detectives leave the room for approximately 10 minutes to ostensibly allow Grant to collect his thoughts. In truth, this is a chance for them to discuss a change in tack. Cody had gotten home, and then there was nothing that that he could do to help me. So I don't remember the exact time when I actually left, but I had left later than what I had said. So you were home when Cody got home? Yes. Tell us about that. After subjecting the detectives to several minutes of silence, Grant volunteers that he'd lied about having been there when Cody got home. It's apparent that this reinvigorates the detectives, as this is the first time Grant has acknowledged there are things he hasn't been honest about. Even after Detective Maltari takes the lead and starts to get by far the most relevant information so far out of Grant, 
even their new strategies fail. Grant again gives a monotone denial of being involved with the deaths. And you've already told us a lie. This whole map thing is bullshit. I just, I, I don't, I don't have the answer for anything else. Okay. This, this is the last time before I'm going to walk out and then I'm done. Then I'm done for good. When I'm done, I'm done, done. They won't believe, hey, can I come back and talk to you? The minute I walk out that door with your story is where you stay at. That's your, that's your lot in life. I am more than willing to sit here all day and all night if you want to, to talk to find the facts. But I can't, I told you from the beginning, I will not deal with somebody who's not being truthful with me. You're not being truthful. I mean, I've been getting blamed for the last half a year for everything, and I've been trying to move forward into a positive direction. And then every day I'm reminded of all the trouble that I had caused. And then I keep being told the same thing over and over again, but there's nothing that I can do to change it. Do you regret doing this to each one of your family members? I didn't do that to each one of them. Finally, the detectives abandon hope that Grant will confess. They bring in his eldest brother, Jason, for an emotional confrontation. I, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't believe you. And I probably will have resentment for the rest of my life, whether you did it or you didn't do it, but I need closure. I need to know what happened to my mother, my father and my brother Cody because I wasn't there to fucking help and that hurts me that hurts me a lot man I may not have been able to stop you you probably may have hurt me too but at least I would have known what happened and now I'm in fucking who knows what now I am lost and it's scares me that you want to leave here and not face what happened because you're putting my life at risk then you're putting Donna's life at risk grandma's life how do we know what you're going to do I don't know what else to say but I'm scared for you and I'm scared for myself and I don't feel comfortable with you being around me alone I'm sorry I could take you physically, but if you have a knife or know where a gun is, I'm fucked. And I have little girls that I have to raise. I have a, a woman that is depending on me for the rest of my life. I understand. Despite sitting across from Jason, as his eldest brother cries, grief-stricken and afraid, Grant maintains the same cold, flat response he offered the detectives. On the 31st of July, 2019, Grant was convicted of murdering his father, mother, and brother. The jury recommended against the death penalty, and he was sentenced to life without parole. To paraphrase the prosecution, Grant's murder of his mother, father, and brother with a definition of cold-blooded. Bearing the facts of the murders in mind, Grant's cool composure during his interrogation is even more unnerving. Chad Amato, 59 at the time of his death, was regarded as a wonderful husband, father, and family man. As per the many heartfelt messages left on his public obituary, Margaret Ann Amato, 61, is remembered very fondly as a kind woman who loved horseback riding and spending time with her family and friends. Cody Amato, 31, is mourned by his fiancée and friends and remembered as someone who made the world a better place and inspired those who knew him.